this, this idea about worship, particularly the musical time, particularly the time in the service devoted to music, was a huge emphasis, huge. Uh, and so on the corporate level, uh, gathering together for uh, the church meant it was time that you were really offering yourself to God in the most sincere fashion uh, possible. And so most of the worship songs in the churches that I was taken to from time to time by my parents growing up had a lot to say about submitting ourselves, had a lot to say about giving our whole hearts completely over to God, had a lot to say about staying on fire uh, for Him in all of life. Now, on the individual level, the way this worked out in this context is that you could sort of judge the degree of your commitment as a parishioner, as a serious church member, by your, your passion for His glory in all of your life. And the way you knew that you were passionate enough is if you were regularly reading your Bible daily, regularly praying a lot, and very important, not living in sin, usually defined as don't smoke, don't drink, and don't hang out with those who do. If you had an accountability partner, then the accountability partner would ask you how your walk was going, and we'd inevitably list off how we were doing in those three things. That was sort of the things you just you kind of thought about. Now, now again, is passionately worshiping God uh, with our lives a part of our calling as parishioners? Sure. As a matter of fact, passionate worship, yes, that, that word, that's a, is that a good thing? Sure. Like feeling, feeling stuff when you think about God, when you worship God. Sure, the psalmist did it all the time. I mean, the psalms really are just a recording of an emotional roller coaster constantly. It's up and down all the time. But there's nothing wrong with worshiping passionately. We want to affirm that. We want to say that that's a good thing. Um, but... Again, I think if this is seen as what it primarily means to fulfill our calling as a parishioner, we're going to inevitably run into some dangers. Uh, for example, we could see the focus of the Christian life about our effort and, as often happens, our emotional experience. Some of you may have had this before where you see a friend that seems to get really emotional and really fired up during worship and you're just kind of distracted and you're not feeling it and you're wondering, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe my Christianity isn't very good. Um, and I think ultimately if we define what it means to be a parishioner or a church member by how well we worship, I, I think we will find ourselves on shifting sand because... Because when I'm not worshiping the way I ought to, when I don't feel like worshiping or when I don't have the same experiences as others do in worship, well, perhaps, perhaps that's evidence that I'm not fulfilling my true calling. Our thoughts are turned inward in this scenario to determine whether we're faithful parishioners. And when our, thoughts, when our thoughts are turned inward, we always go one of two ways. Either we delude ourselves and become proud, or we're very honest with ourselves and we fall into despair. There's really no other way around it if that is the way we go about it. So, so again, is worship uh, part of what it means to be called as a parishioner? Absolutely. Of course it is. After all, I mean, I don't have time to list all the different passages in the New Testament and, and in the Old Testament um, that tell us that one of the reasons we are saved is to glorify God, is to worship Him. So, uh, yes, yes, worship is a good thing, but I don't, think, I don't think we should use our calling to worship as our primary calling as a parishioner. Well, then that leads to a third possible option that has been, I think, fairly common in churches, uh, at least as of late, and that is, um, that is to serve as a missionary. Now, let me, let me explain that. When I say that word, I don't just mean being an overseas missionary. I'm not talking about somebody that travels to a faraway land. What I'm referring to is a popular phrase that came out of the church some time back that said this, Every member a 
missionary. Or some may have heard it, every member a minister. This was a popular saying within a good number of churches in America not that long ago and probably still in, in many churches around. And its meaning was that, was that every member should see themselves as on mission for God in all of their lives. Now surely this is a good thing and is most certainly a part of what it means to be a parishioner. As a matter of fact, what you're being equipped with today in all the different sessions is basically equipment to do that, to be a missionary of some degree to your workplace and to your home and to the various vocations that God has given you. And so um, that's, that's good. That's good. Indeed, many of the stories of Scripture uh, show this sort of activity almost in, uh, instantly happening. Um, for example, the story of the woman at the well in, uh, in John's Gospel is a great example of, of this sort of thing. After encountering Jesus and uh, him sort of uh, opening up her life to her and showing who he really was to her, she can't help but, but tell others about him. That's just, I mean, she just does it. Even though she's kind of told not to do it, she's like, I, I, sorry, I just, I did it. I'm sorry. And so by the time, like, she goes, uh, Jesus arrives at the next town where she had gone, the people of the next town are like, uh, who are you? We want to know all about you because you sound pretty amazing. Now, I've seen this kind of thing many times as a pastor. Uh, when a new convert is first saved, they are always, almost always, the best evangelists. They bring their friends into church, and they, they, they just invite everybody they can, and God bless them. I love that. I mean, so, yeah, we want to affirm that a church member being on mission and seeing themselves that way is good. But, again... The question we're trying to answer here is the thing that identifies you as a parishioner. And again, I have to say, as important as being on mission to our culture is, through our various vocations, being on mission still is not the primary vocation for you as a member of God's church. As a matter of fact, if it does take the primary place, Again, it will inevitably lead to people thinking that the only kind of true Christian work is some means of spreading the gospel to the outsider. And this has been referenced uh, a few times today, but it, we've all sort of felt that way if we've been in church for any length of time, that Christian work meant that you were talking specifically about Jesus as opposed to all other kinds of work. But we've learned today that we don't want to do that. We want to see that all of life is a means by which God is working through us as, as his mask. So, we've determined so far that doing stuff for and with the church, worshiping passionately, and mission work are not ultimately what define you in your calling as a parishioner. So then, what? What is it, Eric? Here it is. The primary vocation of you, a church member, get ready, is to be a receiver. Your first and foremost calling, and it, I'm tell, and it never stops, it never goes away, is to see yourself primarily, first and foremost, as a receiver. Now, what I'm saying here is certainly not a new insight. Um, it's a view that has held sway for quite some time, but that we tend to forget. The reality is this is one of the reasons, at least in, in Lutheran circles, when you gathered with the church for worship, it was referred to with the rather ambiguous title, Divine Service. I don't know if any of you have heard that title for the worship service, Divine Service. Well, who's doing the serving? Who's doing the serving when we get together for the Divine Service? We say first and foremost, it is God doing the serving to us. He is gathering His people together to give them the gifts that they need to walk, on, walk with Him. 
Nicholas Wolterstorff, uh, picking up on this, he's quoted in uh, James K. A. Smith's new book, You Are What You Love, which is tremendous, by the way, it says, quote, the liturgy or gathered worship as the reformers understood and practiced it consists of God acting and us responding through the work of the Spirit. The reformers saw the liturgy or service as God's action and our faithful reception of that action. Receiving. It is God who calls you and assembles you. It is He that has everything you need for your life through His Word and sacraments. Earlier, I referenced that famous passage in Acts 2 where the disciples are shown being together all the time and, um, you know, and being sort of semi-socialist, you know, like they're just giving away their stuff to everybody and no one has any possessions and that sort of thing. Um, but, but there's this, it starts off like this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. That's breaking of bread, most scholars think, is a reference to communion and to the prayers. Now, now, what are all these things but gifts? They're gifts. And they are gifts that they are receiving continuously. And those gifts are still here for you and I today. Thank God that the first and foremost thing you are called to do as a church member is not do anything, but is simply to show up needy. Yes, you can serve at your church in all sorts of ways, but not, remember, not before remembering that Christ has first served you. Yes, you can worship God passionately in spirit and in truth, but really only as a response to the news that He loved you and gave Himself for you on the cross. Yes, you can preach the gospel to your neighbor. Do it. Awesome. But remember that it's only as a response to being imputed with His righteousness and declared holy in the sight of God because of His work for you. When you gather together with your church body, you come with ears ready to be reminded that though you are a great sinner, Christ is a greater Savior still. You come hungry and thirsty for a substitute who continuously delivers his body and blood on the altar for the forgiveness of your sins. You come ready to receive the gifts your neighbor has been given to serve you as a fellow parishioner. So with that being said, now that I've, I've given away the store and I've told you what it's all about to be a parishioner, to receive, first and foremost, and for the rest of your life. You never, by the way, you never move beyond that. I mean, all of us pastors have heard at one time or another when we uh, preach the gospel, people will say, hey, look, you know, that's great, that's great. Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead, but let's get beyond that to the real stuff. And the response from me and from most of the guys I know is, no, 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 all you do is go deeper into that. You never stop needing to receive. Never. You always need to receive that word of gospel truth. But, but I want to close with perhaps the best, most tangible picture I can of, of what I've seen, what illustrates your calling as a parishioner. Um, a few years ago, in a previous church I served, I received a phone call um, about a man that had gone off the deep end. He was a member of my congregation, uh, and he had gone off the deep end in his drinking. Matter of fact, he, he had nearly drunk himself to death. He had been in the hospital by the time I received the call, and, uh, and by that time, he was about to be moved into a halfway house because he could not take care of himself yet. Now, the truth is that up until that time, I had no idea that the guy even drank. I had no clue that he drank at all, but here it was. He was um, a deeply enslaved alcoholic and had almost killed himself. And as a matter of fact, had the intention to drink himself to death. That was his goal at the time. So I, I decided that I would go visit him at the halfway house. And when I showed up, the man didn't look anything like the man I knew. Uh, usually well-dressed and, and put together. Uh, this day his hair was, was messy. Uh, his clothes were tattered. He was just wearing a, a white undershirt that was very messy and dirty. His mouth was, was dry, and he was, and he was shaking all over. So that when I came to say hi and shake his hand, he was shaking. And, of course, that was because 
he was having withdrawals from the alcohol. And just before I arrived at the halfway house, in spite of how messed up he was, he told me that he was struggling with the temptation to drink again, even though it had resulted in all of this problem for him. In his mind, he was thinking, maybe if I just have one more drink, this will go away and all level out. And yet at the same time, he confessed to me that he was ashamed of himself disgusted with himself, broken, needy, repentant. Well, as I normally do, I brought communion with me. And after reminding him that Christ had paid for his sin on the cross, yes, that sin of drunkenness, I asked him if he wanted to take communion with me. And and the only way I can describe his response was it was, it was like a, just a, a groan from deep within. He just, yes, yes, just, just a desperate plea. And so I read the words of Christ's institution to him. This is my body. This is my blood. And I said, for you, the man who almost killed himself has hurt so many around you and sits before me now broken and beaten by your addiction for you, the body of Christ. And with shaking hands, he grabbed the wafer and he put it in his mouth and it took him so long to finish chewing because he he couldn't muster up Saliva. He was so dehydrated from, from his vendor. But he eventually got through that and he took the bread down. And then I had the cup there, the cup of wine, and I said, for the forgiveness of your sins, for, for you, for your forgiveness, the blood of Jesus Christ... And I went to hand the cup to him, and he was shaking so bad that he couldn't hold it without starting to spill it. And so I grabbed his hand and wrapped my hand around his, and together we lifted the cup up to his mouth and poured it in. And then I declared to him that since he had taken the Lord's body and blood, that he was now forgiven of all unrighteousness. From there, the man began to day by day find strength to fight his addiction. He would start serving in church. He would worship passionately as a vocalist on our worship team. And he would tell others about Jesus. He did that stuff. He did. But all that was a byproduct of always and forever seeing himself as a receiver. So, uh, my word to you today, if you want to know what it means to be called as a church member, that's the best picture I can give you. Broken, needy, receptive to your God who never stops giving. Will you pray with me?